Hi, and welcome to the 71st TiddlyWiki Hangout. I'm Jeremy Rustin, the original inventor of TiddlyWiki. And today I'm joined from left to right by Charlie Hitzelberger, who is locked up in a um, corporate um, cubicle and not able to use a microphone to introduce himself. Um, but Charlie first uh, came to my attention, I think, six or nine months ago when he released a fourth interpreter for the Commodore PET that used TiddlyWiki for its documentation, which um, combines so many of the things that make me happy. I was, I was truly delighted when that came out. Um, and next, Eric. Uh, hi, Eric. Would you like to say hello, um, say where you're from, and introduce your connection to TiddlyWiki? Uh, hi, I'm Eric Schulman. I'm uh, the author of Tiddly Tools and the uh, lead developer maintainer of the TiddlyWiki Classic code base and the soon-to-be author of Inside TiddlyWiki, The Missing Manual. Indeed, Eric. And I'm located in Silicon Valley, and I've been working on TiddlyWiki since <laughs> 2005, so... Yes, yeah. almost, almost before it existed. <laughs> well, I think in lots of ways, lots of people in the group were working on TiddlyWiki before it existed. Um, Mario, would you like to say hi, uh, where you're from, and say something about your connections to TiddlyWiki? Yeah, hi, my name is Mario Pitt from Austria, near Salzburg. I contributed to TiddlyWiki Classic with themes and plugins, and yeah, TiddlyWiki 5, creating the German translation, and a little bit contributing to the group. Indeed. Um, great to have you here, Mario. Um, uh, somebody's got a bit of background noise in the background. It's, it's Charlie, I think. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yes, Charlie. Um, and Tobias, would you like to say hi where you're from and say something about your work with TiddlyWiki? So this is Tobias Bier from Leipzig, Germany. I've um, been using TiddlyWiki for about seven or eight years as well, I guess. Uh, doing lots of plugins for TiddlyWiki Classic and now catching up with TiddlyWiki 5. Um, Recently, been trying to figure out how to best uh, get plugins published and maybe uh, start contributing in that area. So, yes. Indeed, great to have you here, Tobias. Um, I should say that Tobias um, was um, not present in the community for maybe nine months or something, having been around in the early days of TiddlyWiki 5 when it was really, I think, when it was before it was in beta, even, I suspect. Um, and then pop back up uh, about three or four weeks ago um, and has been um, all over the groups um, and GitHub digging up old threads, asking lots of <laughs> questions. Um, so one of the, the reason for mentioning that is to explain um, very clearly how um, not only do I not mind that, although obviously it generates work for me, but it's amazing. Um, it, it's through asking questions that, you know, that pulls out answers are available for everybody, so that's very valuable, and uh, it also is incredibly useful to have somebody else reviewing the old tickets. I mean, at a, a mundane level, Tobias has found lots of tickets that needed closing, and um, that kind of tidying up um, is very important in a project like TiddlyWiki, so I'm incredibly grateful for that. But more than that, um, within the last uh, week or so, um, I don't think it's, I really don't think it's that long ago, um, Tobias released his um, uh, compendium of TiddlyWiki hints and tips, um, which I think I've uh, hopefully I've said Tobias uh, I think is a is a wonderful piece of work. Um, so what you've got in here, and it's quite interesting when you look at uh, the full recent changes, is you can see how for every question that Tobias has been asking, he's been updating. Um, documentation. <laughs> and, um, well, so he's now collected together and beautifully tagged um, uh, an incredibly, well, I think the most complete and organized collection of hints and tips. Um, it's terrific stuff, um, Tobias. Uh, last week we spent a good deal of time talking about the um, was it last time? About creating a community wiki and yes, um, yes. Uh, you know, that, that is once again, Tobias, you put your um, you put a very um, a very impressive stake in the ground for that task, and it's really stunning. Um, really pleased. Yeah, good. <laughs> I mean, what do, what was I supposed to do, right? I didn't want to just uh, let the information pass by and then get lost somewhere in the memory. <laughs> Indeed, but it takes a certain you know most of us are so busy 
assimilating information that we're not yeah. so good at recording it and sharing it. Yeah. So that's yeah. um, uh, you know it's a great example of using TiddlyWiki for a start, um, and yes, obviously definitely. intrinsically very useful in the group. So um, as usual, I've got a little list of a couple of things to talk about, but we'll roughly um, you know, um, follow up the threads as they occur to us during this discussion. Um, but the first thing I wanted to start with was Eric Schulman's going to run a demo of some work that he's been doing for turning a standalone TiddlyWiki HTML file into an app that you can run on an Android device. And uh, Eric's already shown me he's got a rig up so that we can see the screen of his Android tablet and hopefully um, see exactly what's going on. So Eric, thank you very much. I'll, I'll pass over to you. All right. Well, um, as Jeremy said, I've been working with a uh, process of converting TiddlyWikis into phone apps, you know, tablet apps, um, specifically targeting Android as the, the current target, but the same process can be used to target uh, Apple, iOS, and um, uh, WinPhone from, from Microsoft as well. Um, basically, there is a service, actually there's an application tool called PhoneGap, which is uh, an Adobe product um, that's based on an open source library called Cordova, that's C-O-R-D-O-V-A, and uh, essentially it's a process by which you can take HTML content and the associated assets and wrap them or encapsulate them within the framework of a phone app. Um, basically, the phone app just has the embedded browser uh, uh, running within it without any of the browser uh, extras, no location bar, no bookmarks, all that sort of stuff. Is So it's just a standard app frame but with the browser renderer so that the HTML content you give to it can be displayed, uh, essentially creating it sort of similar to the uh, web runner um, prism technology, which was to sort of create a, 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 a browser runner, a self-contained application version. Uh, this was done with TiddlyWiki several years ago. So it's very similar to that, except, of course, it creates a, an installable phone app. So essentially, let me um, start off by screen sharing, and I'm just going to see, where's the share, and I'm just going to share uh, a nice new fresh tab like this. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just go to tiddlywiki.com. Uh, because that's where to start from, really. And, okay, so here's a standard TiddlyWiki. And uh, I don't really want to do anything with it except download it, so I'll just hit the Save button. And it pops up with a standard downloader mechanism here. And I'll choose my target, which will be the PhoneGap demo folder. And I'll just call this uh, tw5.html. And if we go ahead and, I guess I can't really open that folder from this screen here. Well, okay, hang on, let me share the other bits of it then. Um, well, first I can show in folder here. Okay, let me. All right, well. Um, Harry, sorry, can I ask a very quick question? This is Chrome on, on what kind of machine? A Windows Seven. Uh, 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 Eric, we don't see any any windows, so I th it seems you don't you see anything. The, no, we we don't. We didn't see the the save as and and this stuff. Oh, uh, we are because we're only seeing the whole window. screen. Yeah, because well, you're only a single I'm, window. You don't. I'm see only it. sharing that that tab, not the. Yeah, let me let me switch my phone sharing to this. There. Now I'm sharing the. The whole window instead of just yeah, the yeah. That's, that's, okay, okay. That's, so this is the downloaded TW5 that I've that I've just um, done, and uh, just to demonstrate. Okay, so this is pretty much all you need to start with is a single HTML file is the minimum you need to submit to create a phone app. You don't need any other assets at all. Of course, most 
HTML files have references to external images and such. So if you did have images, you would simply create a folder or you just put the images in this folder. But essentially, everything has to be contained in, from in, a, in a single folder tree. And the top level folder has to have an index.html. So the first thing we're going to do here is, is quite simply is just to rename this index.html because it has to have that name for PhoneGap to recognize it. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is simply Oops. Oh, we completely lost you, Eric. Yeah. Eric? How weird. <laughs> um, we'll give Eric a couple of moments to reconnect. It's odd because, yes, it doesn't say Eric has left the chat, so it obviously Google still um, thinks he's connected. Probably a problem. Eric, can you hear us? Eric, wave your arms if you can hear us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so look, I think maybe it might make sense to move on, and then if somebody can alert me um, when Eric um, comes back, and then we'll switch back. Um, there was something I wanted to show you um, for your opinions, which is... Um, <laughs> well, at first, there's a little story. Uh, obviously, we're in the middle of a new feature moratorium. Um, and for reasons that we have discussed at the last two Hangouts, um, the, you know, um, the idea is that uh, Jeremy will focus on documentation and TiddlyFox and Tiddly Desktop um, by not doing any new features for TiddlyWiki. And yet, last week, I was quite busy at the end of the week, found myself on a train and with an hour to kill. And so, of course, what did I do but start implementing a new feature? And I had forgotten that when I was thinking about the new feature moratorium. <laughs> but that particular scenario of sitting on a train um, is, is very conducive to... Um, to new features. So um, <clears throat> the new feature was uh, something that we've discussed quite a lot, is the idea of an expandy collapsy tree that you can use to explore the system tiddlers. Um, and it's been suggested uh, independently several times, but I know Mario is, has expressed an interest in the past. And uh, the, the idea is to, um, because the shadow tiddler list at the moment has whatever it is, a thousand entries, and it's, it's quite slow to render, and it's a pain in the neck um, to navigate through. So um, what I discovered on the train is that um, the core needs only a tiny, tiny extension um, to be able to do this. It's a new filter um, called Split Before. Let me screen share and show you. But let me first actually show you the final thing. So what this is is I've put it into the pre-release. So in fact, if you go to tiddlywiki.com slash pre-release, you should see in the pre-release tiddler a link to this explore guy, and it's also present in the sidebar, um, that, that's that tab. So you can see here, this is the top level list of unique stems um, of the tiddler titles and things. One moment. Uh, Tobias, can you see anything? I just see Jeremy's face. Yeah. <laughs> you see my screen share? Didn't pay attention because I'm now, now I see so. the, the screen share. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it's just... Okay, now it works, yeah. Okay, yeah. So you can see that um, there's two... Uh, well, A, I haven't styled the list, so it's still got numbers down the side, which is a bit silly. Um, but there's two kinds of entries. Um, there's links to tiddlers, um, and there's folders, so to speak, um, which are prefixes that contain tiddlers. And um, it is possible, yeah, here, for instance, is an example where we've got both. So we've got a tiddler called theme um, that is a tiddler. So if I click on it, you can see it's the state tiddler that contains the current theme. 
and it's also a prefix for 22 other tiddlers and then I can open those guys out and see um, the individual tiddlers. Now if I choose another example, so something like boot is quite easy. Boot, we've got the CSS and two JavaScript files. Config um, is also pretty simple. We've got a few config tiddlers and then um, a, a few uh, folders. I haven't really got a good word for these things um, containing further sub tiddlers. But the peculiarity you can see here. Um, is that we've got a prefix core with a slash on the end, and for consi that's consistent with the other prefixes. We've also got a tiddler called dollar colon slash core, which is a an actual tiddler, so that's why it's in the list as well as core with a slash after it. Um, and so the trouble is that um, these things, um, uh, well, um, they they loop back. So underneath core. Or we've got core with a slash and then if I open core with a slash in fact both of them open because there's two copies of that tiddler in the tree um, so th I think you can see the confusion that <clears throat> um, and it's clearly it's clearly wrong um, the easiest way to fix it would be to avoid having tiddlers um, that are a prefix of other tiddler titles um, but it's too late for that. Um, so I'm not absolutely clear what is the best way to fix it. Um, and I would appreciate people's thoughts about it. What do you reckon? Uh, why, why is there a trailing slash anyways? At I, any of it shouldn't be. Well, because that's what the prefix is. The shared prefix between all of these guys <laughs> is language with a slash. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah. yes, I mean, I, 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 it's a, it's a fair question. Um, the trouble is that when you try and, you know, self-evidently, this is the wrong behavior, and you, it sounds, you'd think that it would be trivial to express the behavior that we want. Um, but I haven't managed to do that so far. I mean, I say, look here, we've got language slash and languages, both of which um, language is a prefix of. Now, in my so with these guys, um, they need to be shown because they've got children, because they're valid prefixes. This guy needs to be shown because it is a tiddler that we need to be able to navigate to. We need people to be able to reach all the tiddlers in this namespace. Mm. Uh, Jeremy, Jeremy, Eric is back. Oh, great. Um. Eric, hello, welcome back. We'll just very quickly finish up um, what we switched to in your absence. Um, so, I say right now, what I'm thinking of doing is, um, le well, there's a tiny filter that was necessary to do this, the split before filter. Um, so the split before filter takes us an argument, in this case a slash, um, and then it returns of the tiddlers that are currently selected, it returns the unique prefixes. Um, and you may be able to infer here the way that the logic works is that if you've got a string that doesn't contain the character that we're splitting on, then we return that entire title as the prefix. If we're returning a fragment that was followed by the slash, by the separator, then we include the separator in the response. Uh, so that logic is what um, gives us this behavior of getting both palette and palettes slash, oh sorry, core and core slash returned from the top level filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think it's it's not not a, a very big problem because it is system tiddlers um, and and someone which is dealing with system tiddlers, they, I think they can, can live with this at the moment. So maybe we it's can... It's more useful it to have it than not. Okay, so yeah. then another question is where should... Can, can I have a quick question? Yes, please do. Um, when I look at language, uh, I see 
a different number at the top entry than at the lower one. How, how is that? How, how, how come? Um, you, um, it's really obvious that 569 is 557 plus 12. Oh, so, okay, so that's why. Oh. So, oh. if he, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> so annoying. Okay, now that explains it. All right. <laughs> um, isn't it maddening, though? Um, <laughs> The, the other, so another question is where do we put it? What I realized when I was thinking about this, I was thinking we'd make it be the shadows tab. But the trouble is, it's not. Because, well, at the moment, this is displaying both shadow and system tiddlers. And when you're exploring this namespace, that feels obviously correct. You shouldn't have to distinguish between system tiddlers that exist because they were shadows and system tiddlers that are in their history list um, that is, uh, there's actually you know, um, a non-shadow tiddler. So that means that it, it's not the same as either the system nor the shadows tab. So at the moment I've made it be a separate explore tab, but that just makes it seem like we've made things more complicated and not less complicated. Um, so I, I'm wondering um, if there's not something fairly fundamentally wrong here. Um, one possibility is that the way that we show a single list that contains both what I call folders and individual tiddlers, maybe that's not right. It certainly ends up, I think, looking very messy. The way that this is um, a list that mixes two different types of things um, just feels kind of um, uh, unexpected. Um, it doesn't look very consistent. Uh, Jeremy, is, uh, is it not possible to have two different lists, one with system and one with shadows? Just Well, you could, but then if you think about it, um, the, I mean, so you could use it for, you could absolutely um, imagine a version of this that was in here that just showed shadow tiddlers. Yeah. But my argument is that that ends up being quite confusing because um, when you, for instance, if you drill down to look to see if there's you know, this particular um, shadow tiddler, you're not getting any information about whether it is a... Um, you wouldn't see it if it was a system tiddler that wasn't also a shadow tiddler. So it means it's a sort of incomplete okay. slice. And then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not explaining it very well. It's a bit imprecise. But um, it feels as though if, you know, two options that make sense is to have system and shadows as we always have. Very clear, makes it really obvious what the, dis well, doesn't make it obvious what the distinction between the two groups of tiddlers is, but it makes it very clear that there is a distinction between the two sorts. Um, and you get the benefit, I quite like the system tab, the way that it's generally got a relatively small number of tiddlers in it, um, and it gives you a good idea of what's being customized and so on. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think the explore tab would be a good substitute for that. Um, I, would, I would think that uh, merging the two makes a lot of sense, system and shadows, because they're really not so different in their nature. Um, except in, 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 from some perspectives, I think that's right. So when we're, I think that, that's putting into words better what I was sort of trying to say here, which is when you're exploring the namespace, the yeah. distinction doesn't really matter. But at other times, when you're trying to think what is mm -hmm. in this tiddlywiki versus what is in the plugins in this tiddlywiki, the distinction seems very important. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that line of logic just um, ends up with, I think, what we've got here, where we have um, yeah. all three tabs. And the problem I'm raising, or the question I'm raising about that, is that then, in our quest to simplify things, we've actually made things more complicated by adding another tab. <laughs> but we could have, like, one tab and three radio buttons on top, so you would choose which one you want to look at, and... Uh... So you could constrain it a bit to only system, only shadows, or explore, like all. Uh, yes, actually. I mean, that would be a better use. So I think we could fit that in at the top of this explore tab, and yeah, that would fit quite nicely, I agree. Or just two checkboxes to check system and shadows, yeah. you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, so, so the, you you can design your own uh, possibilities. So you have, yeah, with checkboxes, you can say, okay, I want to see the shadows or system or both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, it feels to me as though this we need to keep definitely keep the system tab as it is, as in being able to visually scan the system tiddlers without expanding and collapsing anything. I think is quite useful because there's few enough of them um, that it's, you know, whenever I can, I'd rather scroll two screenfuls of stuff than click on something. I think Actually, I would prefer something slightly different than that, uh, or in addition to that, it's like a little filter box on top. <laughs> so where oh, you can yeah, so you string can to... You could certainly imagine that as well, and I think that's yeah. a, an orthogonal suggestion. And, that and what, what if you only use the shadows, the shadows uh, tiddlers with the namespace? Well, now this is, that's more questionable, isn't it? The um, I mean, again, as it happens, I don't mind finding things this way, um, and I think that's because scrolling is on my laptop. It's quite a nice, fast operation. Um, and um, so, don't know. It's um, it's not as it's not the same strong case as the system tab. Um, but I think the maybe the strongest case for the shadows tab continuing to exist in its flat form um, would be um, for consistency with the system tab. But you could also imagine again a gadget up here that lets you select: Do you want a flat list or a tree list? Um, mm -hmm. My concern then is, uh, you know this, that I always, I always think of making it configurable as being a poor cop-out, um, as in I think um, it's, it's my job in the core to try and capture the most useful, most general functionality. Um, I think if I just expose all of the different variations in how to use TiddlyWiki, there's different configuration options. What you end up with is a core that's very hard to test um, because there's so many options governing its use, and that's why we prefer the, um, you know, the people adding plugins as a way to customize the behavior of TiddlyWiki. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I think I think we can we can live at the very beginning. So uh, with the pre-release, uh, just let's have uh, the system titler uh, um, and shadow titler and explorer, so we can use it a little bit and see and see um, yeah how how well it it, it is. That's and I'll look at um, I'll look at adding the gadget for selecting the checkboxes for select well, or drop down or something for choosing between shadows systems and both. Mm. Um, okay. So, Eric, I'm sorry, finishing up on that took longer than... Oh, Eric, you are still here, great. Um, are you ready to pick up where you left off? <laughs> I suppose so. We could, so Eric, Eric, we, we could see, we could see uh, as you renamed um, the TillyWiki 5 HTML to index HTML. So this so that's, where, where that's where it ended. Okay. 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 So, just to recap, I went to TillyWiki.com and I downloaded a copy of TillyWiki 5. Just whatever it delivered, that's what I got. And I renamed it as index.html. And uh, then, oh, let me screen share. That would help, would it? Uh, there we go. And OK. So I renamed it as index.html. And then I created a zip file from it. The process for creating a zip file depends upon your system, of course. But in Windows, it's as simple as right clicking on the index.html and choosing add to archive and it has a built-in you know Windows supports creating zip files. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of uh, applications for creating zip files on different platforms but whatever it is just create a zip file. Um, the next step is uh, let's assume that you've created a PhoneGap account which basically you go to build.phonegap.com and you can go through the process of creating a new account there. Uh, I've already created an account and I've already created an app within that account which you can see is the TiddlyWiki Classic test that's shown on the screen here. But for our purposes we're just going to pretend that this was a fresh account and that there's no applications there so just ignore the one that's listed there. But we'll just go to the new app button and it'll prompt for where to um, 
create your app from and you can either create an open source app which is only from a github repository so what you can do is instead of creating a zip file you can take your index.html and create a github repo and then you can give PhoneGap the repos URL um, but that creates what's called an open source app uh, whereas if you want to create a private app which is what I've been focusing on uh, you create a zip file and so instead of pulling it from a git repo you would simply upload the zip with your content and so in to, to ask for upload you choose your file and it go ahead uploads it now I didn't tell it what else to do um, but I just told it to upload and uh, okay so it, it wants a, a name for it so we're just going to call this uh, TW5PG demo and we'll say this is TW5 for PhoneGap now PhoneGap has two ways to use it the way we're showing here is the online website you can also install the full PhoneGap development environment on your system and do all of this locally uh, but this uh, PhoneGap build service um, you don't have to install the SDK or any of the development tools on your system at all you simply have to submit your content to the online service and they do all the building there so in this case we gave it a name we gave it a description uh, we won't worry about the other options here and it says ready to build so we'll just hit the oh, right, click the right place ready to build and you can see it's building and it shows status for uh, iOS Android and WinPhone and you can see that iOS has stopped and it's showing red and that uh, WinPhone has now completed it's showing blue and Android is still uh, calculating and it takes a little while longer but not too much longer and shortly it will pop up and now it's all done so we, we've just built the application for the three different platforms for iOS for Android and for WinPhone now why is this one red and the others are blue if I click on the red it's going to tell us here the status of the build and it says for iOS it says there was an error and if we click on the error button it will tell us you must first provide a signing key first um, for building Apple uh, apps Android app uh, for iOS apps iPhone apps you must sign the app um, and to sign it you have to be a registered Apple developer and so you're given a signing key when you become an Apple developer and that key then has to be provided in order to build the iOS app for building uh, Android or WinPhone you don't have to sign the app but you can sign the app to make an Android app that can be uh, published in the um, in the Google Play market um, you have to sign it uh, but you can install things on Android from other than the official Google Play market so that any install file you want it doesn't have to be signed to be installable it only has to be signed to be distributed through the Google Play marketplace so what this has done now it's taken that index.html file and it's built in this case it failed to build the iOS install but it did build an APK file that's Android package that's the install file for Android and an XAP file which is the um, uh, install package for uh, WinPhone uh, so to install this uh, all I need to do is click on this APK and it will prompt me to download this uh, APK file now, of course downloading it to my desktop here to my PC doesn't really make much sense because I'd have to transfer it to my tablet in order to actually install it so what I'm going to do instead is if we go up to the top of the project of the app display it's this is showing the status on it but if you go to the top here we can see that there is a barcode here and this is where now it's going to get interesting I'm going to stop screen sharing if I can figure out where my cursor is there we go stop screen sharing and I'm going to move my camera to do old-school screen sharing here 
<laughs> Here is my tablet. And hopefully, when it starts up, we can see it properly. Okay, can you see it okay, sort of? Yep. Yeah. All right. So, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to uh, scan that barcode. So, I'll just bring up a barcode scanning application. And let me get the camera to point over here. It already caught the, the barcode and scanned in a URL. So if I tap on that and say, yes, let's use Chrome. And it takes you to, oh, interesting. It problems a couple of times, but that's OK. That's because I don't have it set as a, a hard default. And that didn't work. Well, OK. So much for that, right? OK. Well, the other way to do this is to simply start a browser on my tablet and go to PhoneGap and go ahead and do my sign in. And there we are at my account, and we can see the TW5PG demo project sitting right there. And if I click on the Android and just say use Chrome there, did that not work? Well, now I'm now I'm looking like a fool, right? All right. Right. There's yes. a prompt at the bottom of them asking yeah, you whether you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. This uh, yes, it's this file type of file can harm your device. Do you want to keep the APK anyway? And I'll say yes. Okay. So and uh, so, already yes. there. so so now it says downloading. Okay. So it has just downloaded it. And so if I go to the notifications here, it says download complete. And if I tap on it, it is now uh, attempting to install it. And um, this is an ex it, it recognizes it as an existing app because I have already uh, done this before. So I'll just hit install, and it says app not installed. I don't know why. Well, huh? All right. Well, this demo didn't go so well, did it? Um, you have you have a version? I have a version already installed on yeah, the tablet. All right. So I'll just show you that. So had that worked properly, it would have gone through the regular um, Android install the app process and would have resulted in the ability to run this little icon here, TW5 for PhoneGap, which it takes a little while to start up. When you, and, oh, you can specify a splash screen. But here it is. This is TiddlyWiki5 running on the tablet, but not as a browser. What's that thing in the bottom right? It looks like the Zoom controls or something. Oh yes, in fact there is. This is um, this is not just TiddlyWiki five. Let me show you. I can because I can do uh, pinch zoom. Ah. Okay, and to do pinch zooming requires more than just the the simple index file that I submitted. Um, so let me go back to screen sharing and show you a bit of the more advanced set up issues because that really illustrates the full picture. So what we did initially was we simply took an index file, made a zip file out of it, uploaded it to a website, let the website chew on it, and then downloaded an APK to the Android tablet and opened it to install the program. So that was the general, that's the whole sort of sequence of the tool chain. But, but to... Uh, uh, Eric, Eric yes. uh, so for, 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 let's say, a standard uh, content uh, application, so there is nothing else but the index HTML and that's it. Well, uh, and any associated uh, assets, like yeah. images, yeah. And audio, images, and media yeah. type of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, basically it's an index.html and the associated assets in a folder and subfolders so that okay. it's all, you know, the, the same restriction on, on folders as TiddlyWiki itself has. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so, uh, but there's a great deal more that you can configure uh, with the, the build. There's some settings and options that can be done through the online phone gap build interface. So, for example, if I go to this fellow here and I click on settings, it has some choices for upload a new file, etc. But then it has a place you can upload the icon, the uh, PNG file that you'd like to, to use as your icon on the tablet. Uh, you can also set the title uh, and this package information here is what determines whether it's a, uh, that this is sort of the unique identifier for the application. So I might put in something like com.tiddlywiki.tw5pgdemo. Um, it's done in the sort of reverse URL fashion. Uh, but having put that name in there, that, that now makes it a unique um, identifier for that app. So it, anytime you create an app, if you use this same package ID, it will think it's the same app being reinstalled. If you give it a different package ID, it thinks of it as a unique app. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some uh, settings here. This configuration is for the version of PhoneGap to use because there's several different versions that can be wrappered in. Um, and so there's some settings. And these are the minimum settings here. But this doesn't give you full control over what PhoneGap is able to do. There are many more PhoneGap options. And to use those, instead of just providing an index.html, and I'll go up a level here where I have one. Um, and actually, let me just copy that down into here so we can muck about with it a bit. Um, what you do is next to the index.html file, you create a config.xml file, which will have all of the uh, configuration settings for PhoneGap. And uh, PhoneGap online has documentation uh, for you know, what all goes in here. But I have already uh, constructed, and I just double clicked when I didn't mean to, because now it's going to do this, and that's not what I wanted. Let me just... Uh, open this with uh, WordPad so that we can see what's in it. And we can see that there's there's a lot of the sort of standard must have this, you know, syntax in it. But essentially, you can see here we define the ID. This is the, uh, the same thing that we just entered in on the online setting, but here it is just in the code. And the version numbers and the name and the description and an author. Um, but then we have these... Uh, statements like gap platform name Android this section here allows you to control which targets you're going to build for uh, by default if you don't have a config.xml it builds Android iOS and WinPhone as you can see there's also three other targets in here WebOS uh, Symbian and Blackberry um, but what I've done is I've just done uh, the target is just for Android, and I've commented out the rest of them. I could have left them out of the, the XML file entirely, but I left them in for, for easy reference later on if I want to enable them. Then there's another section here. This uh, defines preferences for the orientation. You can define it as landscape, portrait, or if you don't define it, it will auto-rotate as you, as you tilt your, your phone or tablet. But you can set it to landscape, it'll fix it to landscape mode and it won't auto-rotate. You can also define a, a value for full screen, true or false, which um, sh uh, suppresses the display of the status, the notification bar, um, but it's still accessible if you swipe down on it. But uh, full screen true allows you to really take over all of the real estate of the screen and otherwise it leaves a stripe at the top for the notification bar. <laughs> There's some Android specific um, declarations for what size screen resolutions should be handled. And then there's a section to define which permissions. As you know, when you install an app, um, it'll tell you which kinds of access to the phone it needs, whether it wants a GPS or, or uh, be able to create files or use the camera or, or any of those kind of things. And by default, phone gap apps are given all permissions. That's the, they request everything. But if you put this statement, permissions... Uh, value none, it suppresses the request for permission so that your phone gap doesn't require any permissions. But then you can selectively add back in which permissions you want by using these the syntax you see here. So in this particular example, I turn off all permissions and then I request the geolocation, the GPS access. 
Um, so that uh, that uh, determines which permissions will be requested when you install the app. Then for certain uh, kinds of functions, for certain phone functions, you need to have additional libraries added to the uh, to the uh, assembled app, um, and they call them plugins. So these plugins, these are phone gap plugins, and here's one of them, which is the geolocation plugin, and the other one here is the one that's called the zoom control plugin. And so when you include those, they're essentially telling PhoneGap to add some additional libraries to the encapsulated application uh, to, provide a to provide the functional access. And what these plugins do is they give you a JavaScript API for accessing these libraries of functions. Uh, so, uh, and Eric, and which yes. one is, is responsible for Pinch and Zoom? The, is the, last, the last one you see, there, the one that says Zoom Control. Okay. Okay, there are a, a large number of plugins available. If we go to the PhoneGap build site here, we can just click on plugins, and you'll see that, and we can turn off iOS and WinPhone. We don't need those. Uh, but for Android alone, uh, and there's some standard PhoneGap plugins that are all part of the Cordova open source, which is, by the way, Cordova is an Apache project. Uh, but this gives you, so these are the standard libraries for giving you access to battery, camera, capture, console, contacts, device, device motion, device orientation, file access, file transfers, geolocation, globalization. There's an in-app. So there's a bunch of different plugins that are standard parts of the Cordova uh, set of libraries. So each of these basically is a different functional library that gives you access to the tablet-specific uh, platform features and gives you a JavaScript API to, to access the library. Mm -hmm. So in the case of, uh, of my uh, plugin, here, let's see, we'll go back to the uh, config. So I've used the Zoom Control plugin and the geolocation plugin. So if we go back over to here, now the Zoom Control plugin is actually a third-party plugin, but they they say these are all whitelisted, so there's it's they're safe enough. Uh, and there's lots more here. There's there's hundreds perhaps. I didn't really and count how, them up. How do you activate them with Tilwiki? Okay, well let me show you how I activated the Zoom Control. So let me find the Zoom Control plugin here. And so we find the Zoom Control plugin, and when I click on it. It uh, tells us uh, this is the command to put in the config.xml, mm -hmm. and then it says documentation can be viewed here. So we go and we view that documentation, and it tells us about the Zoom control, and it gives us a usage example, which is uh, pure, you know, index a, a, a plain index.html file, and we can see a couple of things in here. First, it has a meta statement with a viewport declaration mm -hmm. with some uh, initial scale and maximum scale values. Mm -hmm. And then it has an onload, it does a, uh, it, it, uh, it waits for device ready and then it calls these three functions. Notice there's a Cordova object mm -hmm. and so under Cordova plugins, zoom control is where it's created its API and there's three functions to call. One is zoom control to enable zoom control. Uh, then the um, one is to uh, enable the pinch zoom handling, and the other one is to enable the on-screen plus-minus controls. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these three functions need to be called on device ready. So basically, mm -hmm. there's two there's two real pieces to this. There's the meta uh, viewport declaration, which gives you the maximum and the initial scale and the maximum mm -hmm. scale values, and then there's these three functions that need to be called when de on device ready in order to initialize the handling. Mm -hmm. So obviously, though, this example is for a plain HTML file and not TiddlyWiki. So some of this needs to be done a little differently in TiddlyWiki. So if we go back to the actual TiddlyWiki file here, oh no, not that one. That's that's the one we just downloaded. That's the plain one. If we go back to a TiddlyWiki file that I've already adjusted here, TiddlyWiki 5 PG, that's for phone gap. Mm -hmm. So the only thing, the only difference between this file and the one we just were downloading is that this file includes two additional, um, two additional 
uh, tiddlers that I created. Okay, one is called Phone Gap Markup. And if we take a look at what's in there, we can see that it literally is a viewport call and also a loading of the Cordova.js script. Mm -hmm. So uh, that obviously the Cordova.js is the sort of the root library for all of Cordova. And so you need to load that um, in the head of your TiddlyWiki. So mm -hmm. putting the viewport and the loading of this script into the markup and there... Um, tagged as raw markup, mm. which means that they'll be injected into the saved TiddlyWiki file mm. uh, immediately preceding, or immediately following, as, oh, as the, at the very end of the head section is where they'll be injected. Mm. Okay, so this, this accomplishes putting the viewport and including the, the base scripting. Uh, the other um, part, of course, is those three functions that have to be called for pinch zoom itself. Um, so what I've done here is created, with uh, Jeremy's guidance on how to assemble it, created a startup module for TiddlyWiki 5, mm -hmm. um, which simply, uh, the export, the startup function simply says, call these three calls that we just saw. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's, it's invoked a little differently than the example code on PhoneGap, but mm -hmm. it is still, you can see what, what's going on here. Now, notice that I've wrappered it in a check to make sure that the Cordova object is defined. Um, that way, mm -hmm. when you run this TiddlyWiki 5 as a standalone TiddlyWiki, like locally, you won't get an error on startup because it's trying to, to run the Cordova objects. Mm -hmm. um, because Cordova.js, you, you don't actually uh, include that in your zip file. Uh, that, how, that big, JS, how big is it? The, the how, JS the file? JS, yeah. I don't actually know. Ah, um, okay. Because what happens is when you submit your index file, part of the wrapping of your index file is to include a number of these standard libraries, like Cordova.js. Uh -huh. So the, the XML file, the config.xml says use certain plugins and so implicitly what's happening is it's it's creating a sort of a virtual web space that mm. has these and so it's adding in it's injecting the additional code needed on the fly so the cordova.js file you don't actually get a copy of it and include it in your project it simply mm. gets added during the build process, build process. Uh, is there is there any is there any cost to to create um, uh, a development environment if if you have a public public uh, repos or a private okay. repos, okay, Co cost you mean as far as real dollar amount? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, the the phone gap product uh, that you download, I'm not sure if there's a fee for that. But the phone gap online service, build.phonegap.com, yeah. they offer a free account or a paid account. I think there's two levels of paid account. The free account allows you to create one app using the zip process, and uh, and I think up to 25 apps using uh, using GitHub repos. Uh -huh. The paid service, which the minimum is uh, $10 a month, which is a very small amount of money. So t for $10 a month, you can get up, I think up to 25 zip files and an unlimited number of, of GitHub repo. Also, oh, the zip the zip files are private private. Uh, the zip files are private. The GitHub repos, okay. by definition, it has to be a public, public. repo. Okay. And yeah. so yeah, and so for for a lot of projects for for the project that I that I'm looking at this on, they want to keep their content private. Mm. So that the now the advantage is that if you distribute a TiddlyWiki file to people, they can you know dig down into it and get to your content and lift out whatever mm. they want. Mm. When it's wrapped up as a PhoneGap app, you can't really look at the source anymore. Indeed, so, they'll have to take screenshots of the content. Right. So it's a nice way to be able to package your content without it being easily uh, appropriated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, of course, you know, and it also extends the TiddlyWiki ability because with the PhoneGap plugin architecture, like the Zoom Pinch Zoom, there's other ones. For, ex for example, the GPS plugin, yeah. uh, you load it with, you know, in the XML file, you simply say, I want to use the GPS location functions, and then 
um, the initialization for it is a, quite a bit more involved than the uh, than the pinch zoom, which is simply these mm -hmm. three function calls. But for GPS, you can initialize the GPS and then set up uh, callbacks to uh, watching, so that when mm -hmm. the GPS changes, it will automatically call back your JavaScript function. And that, of course, will be written as a tiddlywiki plugin with probably a widget that when it, you know, on callback as the data gets updated, it would then have some way of refreshing the display to show you your current is it, position. Yeah, is, it, is it needed that the application is running if you, that, that the callbacks are uh, executed, or is if, even if uh, Tilwiki uh, application is not running, the callbacks are also activated, so that you can create tiddlers uh, without uh, Tilwiki running? Ooh, well, no, I I suspect it. So no, similar, I, similar to a service. So probably, probably it would be a service then. Yeah, okay. It's a question of whether the um, app can run in the background, the Cordova app. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think on Android, um, uh, it's quite easy to say that you want to be able to run. Uh, well, but it's, I it's, didn't. It's I have a, it may actually, it may actually be a, a configurable. Yeah. Plug-in to support background execution. In fact, I think I think I saw something along those lines. That if you want to have, basically, yeah. all of the features other than just browsing, simple browsing, yeah. are are various kinds of Cordova plugins to extend it to mm. give you. So if you want to con control you, the rotation or yeah, did you try it for for other uh, uh, to build for for let let's say did you try it with the Windows Phone or something like this? Um, have actually, I, well, I don't have a Win phone to run it on, to try it. Um, ah, okay. But the the um, it did build a Win phone target. Yeah. So yeah, could, uh, could, in theory, all you need is a Win phone, and you just go go there and hit the install button, and mm. you're happy. Uh, did Did you have some? Or do you have some experience with saving? So if you if you change something, is it possible? No, not really. I, I've I've been thinking about that. There's two issues. One is that in order to save, you need file system access, which mm -hmm. is one of the Cordova options, so that you can mm -hmm. add the, the file system plugin, which allows you to read and write local files on the tablet. The mm -hmm. other issue, though, is that because it's a phone app, what does saving do? Does it save out an HTML file? No, because it should, then, it should then, just then save the tiddler. It should, yeah, but it should save it where? In the in the phone app. No, it, it, it should save it in, in, the, down, in, the, in the downloads folder or some, somewhere. Oh well, you could save it as a TID file, sort of. Yeah, yeah external yeah, yeah. Ex export. Yes, to do that, to, to actually save an external file, um, you would you would add in the for, the phone gap plugin, which supports file I/O. And that plugin that actually gives the the uh, PhoneGap browser the um, file reader and file writer objects from mm -hmm. HTML5. Is, is, so there that that, is there yeah. a database? A database too? So instead of yeah, files, there is, a, there is a SQL plugin. Okay. So uh -huh. that I, no, it's not actually a database, but it's it's access to one. Yes. Yeah. So, I, so I would imagine that IndexedDB is accessible, um, uh, not on iOS, but it would be on um, Android. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so there's a, a huge, if I go back to the plugin list here, um, oh, where are we on? This, oh, right, this was the so, plugin so list. So Tilwiki only would need a, a different adapter um, to, to, to access a database or so. Probably if, if right, if right. See, here we have sense. things things like Status Bar, but there's also things like a Facebook plugin and a Google Analytics plugin and yeah. uh, uh, custom URLs. So if you want to have your own kind of, you know, my my colon colon. Yeah. Here's a SQLite plugin. There's an in-app browser so that you can do uh, embedded browsing. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a child browser, I suppose, that blocks unsafe sites and, and such. Here's uh, also email, one. yeah, sending, uh, I, I did see email, so sending emails from Tilwik, I think this would be cool too. It would be an email composer. Yeah, uh, like what that. most, of, most, a lot of these things, what they do is they allow you to invoke what in, in Android land is called an intention or an intent. Mm -hmm. So that basically you have several different ways of sending an email on your tablet. Maybe you have one email program, maybe you have several, um, mm -hmm. and that uh, your TiddlyWiki, if it wants to send an email, uh, invokes the API that triggers the intention, and then it pops up that little thing that says, how do you want to send an email? Pick your application from the ones that you have available, and 
launches yeah, it off. It. Uh -huh, uh -huh, right. Uh -huh. So, so that a lot of a lot of these things are essentially ab, uh, uh, access to various intentions of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a calendar here. Background mode. Let's take mm -hmm. a look and see what what it has to say about background mode. So, to to install mm -hmm. it, you add this line in your config.xml. And then if we look at the documentation for background mode, it says it supports iOS greater than 5, Android, and okay, and it says here's what you're supposed to do. Um, and let's see if they have an example. By using the plugin. Simply add the plugin, and the app will run while in background. Uh, plugin creates window.plugin.background mode with two methods, enable and disable. Mm. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, I suppose if you want your TiddlyWiki to run in background mode um, uh, would be possible. all the time, you would simply uh, add this one line of code in a startup module in your TiddlyWiki 5. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as it started up, it would be background mode enabled, and you could switch away from it, and it would continue to run. So using background mode enabled and then... Also, using the GPS functions, you could start up, enable background mode, fire off a GPS monitor with a callback function that's of your own writing, which takes the data from the GPS and continuously refreshes it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, so depending upon what plugin you're using, obviously, there's you know it can be just a simple function call, or it can be, for instance, if I go to uh, location and, or something. And you, okay. you did you did explore this these possibilities uh, to create uh, let's say inside Telewiki, I think. Uh, or was well, it just no. Uh, no, no, this was not for, for inside Tiddlywiki. This is for a uh, client ah, okay. who, it, who is developing content using Tiddlywiki five and mm. wants to be able to distribute it as a phone app. I follow it. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, so this is—it's a uh, private, what, uh, what, private project that's going on. Uh, what's about what's about speed? So, okay, your your tablet is very new with eight cores, so I think it should be uh, nice. Yeah, it, it it the the question of performance is always you know interesting. Uh, I have a very old Android phone that hasn't actually been able to update its system in over two almost three years, um, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's it, so it's considerably slower. Yeah, but and it works. It does work. It takes a little while longer to load. Yeah, okay. And one of, okay. one of the uh -huh. things that I didn't actually put into my config XML yet, but you can define the icons that you the, the icon and the splash screen mm -hmm. for your app. So the icon, of course, is what shows up on the on the home screen when you when you place it there. But the splash screen will show up during the phone gap load Hello. time. So that so that on slower machines, at least you can you know put up something you know eye candy for them to look at while it loads with a little you know please loading wait message or something. Mm. Um, yeah, so but it's could, not live; create, it's just a splash screen. Yeah, you could create a screenshot of Telewiki and display this one uh, instead of. The, of the yeah, that, people have done that before. You take a you make a screenshot of what the eventual yeah. rendered content will be, so that it looks like it's it's there, but just but then that actually has the disadvantage of it looks like it's ready, but it's not. Yeah, so, okay. it's, it's what yeah. iOS does it by default. Actually, is it saves the screenshot yeah. of the app when it closes it. And yeah, yeah, it is it, as confusing as you would think. So, but but yes, that can be done. So essentially, to to review, the process is that you take your your TiddlyWiki document and you name it index.html. You create a config.xml next to it, in which you put your various phone gap configuration options, all of which I got by you know reading the online documentation where it, you know walks you through what all of the different bits mm -hmm. and pieces are. Uh, so you have an index HTML, a config.xml, and whatever assets, uh, images, audio, video, etc. that you need, uh, all in one folder and any subfolders below it so that all references mm -hmm. from your index are relative. Mm -hmm. uh, and you take that and you put it into a zip file or mm -hmm. you put it into a GitHub repo. But I just stayed with the zip file because that's very much easier mm -hmm. 
don't have to worry about installing GitHub and committing files and doing all of that and such. But mm. if you had a project that you were working on with a bunch of people, you could make a GitHub repo for this um, and do the same thing. But mm. you put in a zip file and then you either submit the URL of the repo or you upload the zip file to mm. PhoneGap and based upon what's in the config.xml, now, if you omit the config.xml, just this review, if you omit the, omit the config.xml, PhoneGap will still build it, and it will use all of its defaults, which is to request mm. all permissions and to build for all three targets, etc. Mm. Um, but with the config.xml, you can specify which targets, what screen resolutions, whether you want it to be landscape or portrait, what permissions the app should have, and what additional access to phone functions using the PhoneGap plugins. So that's all in the config.xml. You take yeah. that, you zip that up, you send it up there, it automatically just goes ahead and builds it, and it uh, gives you on the, on the screen, it gives you either the... the um, the QR code that you can scan, or just a clickable link, uh, which downloads the APK, which is in this Android package file, uh, and downloads the APK, which when you then open it on your tablet, does the normal install process. Now, an APK from PhoneGap is not necessarily signed, which means that you can't necessarily put it out on Google Play. To mm. sign the Android app, you need to have a uh, you need to get a proper signature and be an uh, uh, Android developer and get a signature for it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one one, one yeah. last question. Um, so, for example, so the real real applications may have some some private tokens uh, to access uh, database backend uh, and and something like this. Uh, what's about the security mechanism? How safe uh, are are these let's say secret informations? Well, Do you have information about this. I I don't. I can't say for sure because I'm still fairly new to this myself. There's, um, I think there's two parts to that. There's information that's in the APK, and that's definitely not secure because an APK yeah. is just a zip file and anybody can. Yeah. Open. Uh -huh, okay. And uh, then there's uh, in terms of private storage on the device, and I believe on Android that you can get a sandbox file folder that other apps cannot access. So I believe um, that it uh, is absolutely possible to store secrets that the operating system prevents Jeremy, other apps from yeah. accessing. Okay, okay, okay. Jeremy, something okay. you just said, which I was not aware of, but it does make sense. You said an APK is just a zip file? I believe it's a renamed zip file, yeah. Interesting. Half so it's a zip files file within the additional... world are uh, renamed zip files. Is <laughs> um, <laughs> well, certainly sense. true for uh, iPhones. Back. Yeah. You know, it's just a question of what's in it as to whether or not it's an install or not. Yeah. Right. But the format is a zip file. That's very interesting. Um, that suggests that if I take an APK file, I should be able to open it up. If I rename it as .zip, I should be able to just open it up and look at its content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe so, yeah. So, but, but as far as security and access to content go, it does certainly provide an additional hurdle for casual, you know, people just wandering around looking at your stuff. Mm. Um, it provides also, for people who want it, they can sell these apps on the App Store. It provides a... a, a well, well um, yes. As a matter of fact, one thing, I, one thing I was considering is that there's... I um, did with TiddlyWiki... Oh, and I've, by the way, I've tried this with TiddlyWiki Classic as well. And while the... Um, the, like, for instance, the pinch zoom stuff, obviously there's a, a difference in the way you uh, add the, the meta statements to... Uh, classic, you know, is by putting them into a um, the uh, uh, markup prehead or post body mm. or pre pre body, mm. you know, and that the the plugin instead of creating a startup module, you just create a you just put those three lines of code in a, in a tiddler marked system config, but it works mm. for tiddlywiki classic as well. Now I have a number of documents I've created for classic that were sort of what I called quick start documents. One of them was a collection of Shakespeare plays. And I was thinking it would be very easy to simply take all those, give it a very nice mobile uh, friendly uh, layout, you know, theme mm -hmm. for it, and have a downloadable tiddlywiki, the complete works of Shakespeare that you could just download to your phone and sit there and read uh, using nice tiddlywiki interface. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. I think it's really cool, uh, and um, 
uh, it's something that I would quite like to experiment with myself. So it's quite cool to have Eric experimenting with it on everybody's behalf. And and now to to dovetail this into the other part of my conversation, which is just very briefly, is the Inside Tiddly Wiki book project, which is an Indiegogo fundraiser that's currently ongoing, uh, which is doing uh, reasonably well for fundraising. But one of the targets of that, uh, the book will be uh, initially published using Tiddly Wiki as an online website. But using PhoneGap, it should be completely trivial almost to take that inside Tiddly Wiki, Tiddly Wiki document and turn it into a downloadable phone app so that you have the entire reference just sitting there on your tablet. But, uh, and searchable, I think this is... Well, yeah, well it will be searchable in that all of the functionality inside, because if, if we look at, well, we can't see it here, but if we look at the Tiddly Wiki 5 file that I uh, installed on my tablet, Everything that you can do inside Tiddly Wiki, searching and everything else, is still fully functional. So you can create a very robust Tiddly Wiki 5 interactive application with all sorts of wonderful functionality, including access to phone functions like GPS. Mm. And then, ro so you can use, since Tiddly Wiki 5 is so configurable, you could make it look like an application and function like an application and then wrap it up in the phone gap encapsulation and you essentially have created a phone application. Yeah, but you don't have a, a, a persistent state at the moment, so this a little bit of work needs to be done. Well, the persistence for Tiddly Wiki, you know, for just making it editable, but the argument there is that I think that this is a different path. If you want to have mm -hmm. Tiddly Wiki editable on your tablet, simply download Tiddly Wiki and open it in your browser. It's mm -hmm. it's not that difficult. This is more of a uh, endpoint distribution, which I think of as mostly read only. I mean, yes, you might mm -hmm. want to have some persistent data that's associated with it, but that mostly I think of of the phone gap as a sort of a a way of publishing read only uh, interactive tiddly wikis. You know, they could mm -hmm. be tools. An example I've been discussing with somebody is an administration tool for uh, monitoring your um, your your web services. Let's say you're running a large server farm and you've got dozens of servers and what you normally do is you keep a whole bunch of URLs to the various uh, monitoring you know, sites on your service so that you can check your you know, admin screens and such. But you could take all those URLs and roll them into a nice tiddly wiki and then wrap that as an app and what you have essentially then is a dedicated app on your phone for monitoring your cloud. Mm -hmm. Indeed. No, it's very cool, Eric. Um, it's, um, it opens up some interesting areas and every one of those plugins um, that you showed us on the Cordova site you know, represents an interesting afternoon's experimentation, I suspect. Exactly. Now, of course, there's, there's for each of these, it would be uh, you know, the, the, the one line that goes in the config file, but then there's whatever the code example they give yeah, 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 yeah. You no, know, it has, to be, has to be adapted to that. the TiddlyWiki yeah. way. No, it's, a, it's an opportunity for JavaScript hackers, sadly, yeah. at the moment, more than it's an um, a, uh, opportunity for end users. Here's an uh, example, uh, how, SMS. How, how, long did you, how long did you need to, to, to get it going, so in some... Well, it, it, the the initial attempt to just sort of take any any tiddly wiki and have it built um, within one day of starting the, my investigation, I had mm -hmm. a running app on my tablet. Um, there was a couple of glitches along the way. Um, tiddly wiki classic, uh, anything in the two point eight series of tiddly wiki classic uh, won't work with PhoneGap right now. Because mm -hmm. of because of a little bit of code in the core that contains literally contains um, bracket slash HTML bracket as a literal piece of text, and unfortunately PhoneGap parses your your index.html file in order to figure out where to inject things, mm -hmm. and so it ends up seeing that bit of code that's in the middle of of the of uh, the classic code and um, tries to inject stuff there. Wow. Um, the the fix is it was very simple. I've I've already done, and it's part of the two nine zero beta, um, which is 
uh, to uh, split that literal string by putting a, a quote plus quote in the middle of it so yeah. that it won't be recognized by phone gap but still produces the same uh, net result in the code. Mm. Uh, but so, so there was a little bit of that kind of why doesn't this work properly. Um, a curious one, I submitted tiddly tools which is quite large and has quite a bit of, of code going on, and it loads just fine. It does take a little bit of time to load, um, but when you exit from it, it tells you, oh my, Tiddly Tools has stopped functioning. It crashes on exit. Mm -hmm. I suspect this may be because Tiddly Tools uses the on before unload handler, and mm -hmm. that the phone gaps built-in browser uh, doesn't like that. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that if I just disabled my uh, uh, safe exit plugin, which which does those handlers, um, that it might be just fine. Cool. Well, Eric, thank you very much for that. You're um, welcome. I, I I think that will be um, very interesting to a lot of people, and probably in the normal way with Hangouts, just. Um, stoke an appetite from everybody for an Eric um, Android app that does allow saving. Perhaps that's your, that could be your next Indiegogo, um, is to write the ultimate Android app for Tiddly Wiki. Um, easier to raise money for. Um, and I noticed uh, in the background there is looking at the Indiegogo fundraising page. Um, very happy to see you're now standing at $1,770. Um, 24% um, of the um, total, and it's pretty cool because you're pretty much 24% of the, the way through the time as well. Indeed, indeed. So. It's about. It's about. It looks like uh, we might be able to make the goal. Um, of course, I'd love to be able to surpass the goal. Um, so I'm going to continue to find ways of. Uh, pushing, boosting, and promoting this campaign um, every few days um, to encourage people to, to open up their pockets. I suspect that there might be a bit of, a, of, a, of an influx sometime just around Christmas time because people have hinted that, that, uh, that I'm on their Christmas list. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people who aren't certain about how much spare money they've got until they get a bit closer to until Christmas. Until after so, Christmas, exactly. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Well, obviously, we're, um, everybody um, wishes you the best of luck, and uh, I'm sure we're all doing um, uh, as much as we Well, I'm sure there's always more we can do um, to try and help the campaign. Yes. In, in fact, I... If you haven't if you haven't made a contribution, please do so. Uh, the minimum is uh, ten dollars, which gets you uh, access to the discussion group, which hasn't been opened yet. But but access to the discussion group so that you'll be able to uh, participate in uh, reviews of early draft content and sort of be part of the process and not just you know tossing your money away. Um, so yes, and and. By all means, tell all your friends and neighbors and the guy at the grocery store, you know, everybody, that there's this really great book project and that everybody, because like, like Jimmy Wales from, from Wikipedia said, if everybody reading this would make, make a donation, the, the whole thing would be done in an hour. Mm. Indeed, the uneven distribution of wealth in the world. Um, by the way, Nathan, hiya, how are you? I'm guess oh, Hello, I, I'm well. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Um, i glad that you could make it. Um, do you want to quickly say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Nathan Kane. I'm a developer from the United States. I'm working with TiddlyWiki for uh, a little over a year now. Oh. Indeed. Yeah. And um, uh, a few Hangouts ago, you showed us the static site that your girlfriend had produced using TiddlyWiki. Um, mm -hmm. How's that project going? Um, well, they're actually um, uh, uh, working on their second site, um, uh, another small uh, site, and they're working on um, sort of setting up um, some sort of general usage CMS type facilities for um, their non-developer and, and non-designer uh, people to uh, do things um, with their systems. So uh, it's progressing nicely. 
Great, great. Well, um, uh, we it was really good to see that. Um, in fact, it was on the anniversary hangout, I think, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, that you did some screen sharing to show us, pro show us properly. Um, Okay, so uh, in terms of things to discuss next, I don't know that there's anything crying out for attention in my list. I've got a list of um, of topics, um, so just wanted to throw it open. If there's anything, Tobias, Nathan, Eric, Mario, anything about 5.15, um, recent dis any of the recent discussions on the mailing list that anybody would like to pick up. <laughs> I think uh, we should promote uh, the translation possibility a little bit more. So because there is the translator stuff, which is on online now, I think. Yeah. And uh, I have seen uh, a Danish version, I think, from Ton. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dutch someone, version. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Dutch. Yeah. Yeah. Ton um, just sent this out today, which is terrific to see. Um, yeah. And I think we should we should promote this a little bit more on the uh, on the group. Yes, I mean, and on tiddlywiki.com, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, and now that the translator's edition has settled down, um, yeah. this will probably be a good time to do a screencast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how did you How did you do the the uh, How did you get the the tiddlers out of the of the translations tiddlywiki? Um, I um, remind me, how did I do it? Because I think you I did, did it with the Japanese one, didn't I? Um, and did you create single titles or, or multi? Yes, no, no. I got them out into. Oh no, of course. Um, uh, it's um, it's hair raising stuff. Um, there's within the translators plugin. Um, there's a whole load of templates um, that save all the language titles. Um, in the correct locations, I could show you, um, but it, it, it the, there was there was, it was an interesting area because there were several um, possible ways. So one of them, I just I just wanted to know if it is easy or complicated. So it, if it is much work or not much. Well, work. I'll show you the bit. It's very easy. The bit that's um, okay. uh, the bit that's work is I think <laughs> the bit that I've done now. Um, so in the translators plugin, you got these output file templates. So um, one of the most gloriously confusing things. Can you see? There's buttons dot multid dot tid, <laughs> and that's because this is a dot tid file that generates um, buttons dot multids. Um, okay, so you yeah. can see there's a template called multids, and we pass it this prefix, and that. Uh, those templates are here. So, for instance, there's the way that we produce a multid file. There's the way that okay. we produce. Yeah. So, um, it's it's kind of hacky. It means that those. If you then look at this. Um, oh, where is it? No, Plugin.info on the annoyingly over on the addition. So, really, we'd like this to be in the plugin, but build commands only live in additions. You've got this nightmare, and if I turn off word wrap, it might make it slightly clearer. So um, <clears throat> we've got this output files build action that just um, renders all of those template files to um, specified folders. So pretty much um, that, that means once you've run that, you'll end up with the files in the output folder. And then you just have to lift and shift them, um, you know, in File Explorer to the right place of the repo, and then Git will give you all the nice diffs, so you can see exactly what's changed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> ah, okay, okay. So there is, uh, there is a little bit of of manual work, but mm. it's not that difficult. And, it's not and bad, and it gets us across to GitHub pretty quickly, which is okay. the main thing, so that um, people can do reviews and so on on the GitHub pull request. OK, OK, OK. So I mean, in the, um, in the future, a way to work that would be um, quite nice, thinking back to one of the things we talked about was um, you know, the uh, roles in the TiddlyWiki community, it would be quite cool that you or um, as language manager or head of languages <laughs> um, or anybody else in the community um, could, on behalf of a translator who's only producing a standalone HTML file, turn it into a GitHub pull request. And as I say, that's 
run one command and then move some files around and review the changes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so the I did add a reference in uh, into the wiki.com for 5.15 to the translators um, edition, um, but it's 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 not very good. I mean, it um, it just links to the translators edition where there is documentation, and there probably should be more information on tiddlywiki.com now, um, uh, actively encouraging people to contribute a translation, for instance. Yeah, also probably a little a little uh, video that shows yeah. how easy it actually is, uh, yeah. and then that they can can see what they are translating, mm -hmm. so that uh, yeah. So because because I think we should have we should have more uh, translations already. Mm. The last the last pre uh, uh, preview uh, gave us uh, I think two two mm. new languages. So Danish and Greek, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean we are, um, uh, and I think there's some um, obvious omissions um, uh, that it, I'm still surprised that we don't have Spanish um, in particular. Um, uh, but once we do have Spanish, then I think um, we are taking a pretty massive chunk of the, you know, uh, by volume of the languages on the planet. Yeah, we have Chinese already, so this is yeah, uh, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> so, the most so, important yeah. one. <laughs> um, uh, excellent. Any other uh, questions or comments about that? Um, okay. Um, so, well, as you know, for um, besides the Explorer thing that I showed you, which is my guilty pleasure from being on the train last week, um, uh, my focus is supposed to be documentation at the moment. So I, I, I have been <laughs> trying quite hard not to have any new features or anything um, uh, on my mind. Um, uh, but and, and there has been a good deal of discussion about the documentation, but I wasn't proposing to go into that here. Mm. Uh, one question. So I saw that um, uh, the French translate, translator uh, did translate, uh, let's say, a bigger stuff uh, or a bigger, bigger amount of, of titles from tilwiki.com to the French version. So what, what do you think should we should we aim to to have? A full translation in the different languages, or just just what's absolutely necessary. Um, it may be that we should have um, uh, what would be the word tier one languages and tier two languages. So um, you know, um, acknowledge that because there's varying levels of enthusiasm and you know, numbers of people involved. Um, that um, in some cases we won't have a full translation, but I think yeah. the goal I'm should be a full translation. Although okay. whenever I think about it, it slightly terrifies me because obviously if you've got, I'm used to the idea that there's a dependency between the core code and translators. Um, but in a way, you know, if, if tiddlywiki.com is being continually translated into eight different languages, it does add quite a lot of restrictions to the kinds of changes that we can make to tiddlywiki.com. But to be honest, that's probably a good thing. Um, you know, yeah, so I'm, I'm not scared by, the, by, by translating the stuff, but by keeping it up to date. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so that's why uh, with the German version, I have, I have, let's say, the basics. I did translate the basics, uh, which is uh, the markup and, and this stuff. And for, yeah, let's say, most topics, I just link back to tiddlywiki.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, we the, we need better tools, and the good thing is that by making the translation mechanism be within TiddlyWiki, when we improve translation tools, we're improving uh, hopefully general purpose um, TiddlyWiki tools. So that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, did I understand that right? That parts of TiddlyWiki.com are now in the empty editions for other languages. Or no, not the empty, empty editions, but, but the okay. language editions. Okay, so it's like a, but they're not very prominently linked from the from tiddlywiki.com, no. So they're kind of hidden in the editions uh, titlers. Uh, right. yes. I mean, they let me just screen share. They're um, the links to them are, are exactly as you say. They're oh, let's get rid of that guy. Um, I just posted the German link. They're under here. Um, mm. And I don't know. I mean, I think that's that's not necessarily a bad position, except that 
people may not know what additions means in the context mm. of Diddly Wiki. Mm. Um, yeah. But I think the, I mean, the obvious thing to have, I keep wanting to make the Tiddly Wiki front page look very different. The way that I would most like to do that is by bringing in um, something like masonry. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen this. It's a plugin that lets you do these kinds of Pictionary, Pinterest-type layouts. Um, so I'd like the front page to have small little boxes um, you know, with, with lots of bits of content in. Um, and uh, what the obvious way to draw attention to the additions is with flags. So there would be one of those boxes would be advertising the language additions, you know, with a um, um, collecting all the flags together. Mm. Uh, Tobias, Tobias, and I have discussed in a GitHub issue uh, about the languages. I would like to have uh, languages uh, uh, number one uh, uh, heading. So, like mm. editions, it should be languages. Yes, I think I think this should say languages. You're right, and then yeah. um, editions should be for things like task management, um, yeah. Bible yeah, studies, yeah, yeah, etc. Yeah, something like yeah. this. Yeah. Um, we should. But there is an issue already. So, okay. The um, Tobias, the question just made me think of something that might be quite useful to do, okay. which is to review what is on tiddlywiki.com. Um, and um, so this is the reason why I'm suggesting this is because this isn't very easy to see. Um, obviously, you know, we see when you explore the website, you kind of see the URLs and the address bar, but you don't get this kind of top level view. So um, there's a number of files in the root that for backwards compatibility are just a redirect and because we're hosted on um, Google Google pages, on GitHub pages, we can't make it a real redirect so you know the user has to click something. Um, mm -hmm. There's uh, index.html as you would expect. All tiddlers.html is the generated static HTML file that contains um, oh, for some reason, sorry, I've just noticed a bug. <laughs> so it's empty, but it's supposed to be. Um, so that's exactly why it's useful to do this sort of thing. Uh, so I imagine that must mean that we have, oh dear, oh dear. Okay, so uh, that's good, um, but all Tiddlers is broken. So I'm afraid that's probably a 5.16 release level bug, um, but I'll need to fix that after this. Um, then there's encrypted.html, um, which is the encrypted version of index.html, test.html, um, which is the um, edition that runs the tests in the browser, and mm -hmm. upgrade.html, which obviously you're familiar with as the upgrade wizard. So then for languages, going up here, we've got a folder for each language um, that contains different stuff depending on the language. So in fact, things like Danish, there's no language folder here, so there's no Danish edition at the moment. And there should be. Um, in the case of French, we've just got an index.html, which has translated some of the content, and an empty.html. You can see here that Mario, for the German editions, has also included static renderings of the tiddlers, and presumably also with that same problem, yep, of an empty all tiddlers.html. Um, so, I don't know, and all that is uh, rendered via a node, uh, or how, how is yeah, this? So all it? these files are um, there's a tilwiki.info. Okay, so so it's from the main repo. You run a command, a node, and this renders all that. Except mm -hmm. the the commands um, are in another repo called build.germaline.github.io. So okay. the goal is that the TiddlyWiki 5 repo contains um, all of the batch files that are necessary for working with TiddlyWiki. Build.germaline.github.io okay. is supposed to be the stuff that's specific to actually releasing TiddlyWiki to TiddlyWiki.com. So it's got, for instance, um, the scripts I use to publish to NPM 
um, the scripts I used to publish to Tiddly Space. And uh, those are generally not, um, you know, I wouldn't consider, they're, they're useful for people to copy from, but they're not designed to be used, um, uh, you know, unmodified. Um, but the configuration is in the tilwiki.info file of the editions. So uh, how to build static and this stuff. Uh, yes, where is that? So if you go to the five the editions folder. So they're telling the build commands how to construct uh, the stuff for, uh, for the main website. Yeah. Yeah, so um, what I'm slightly confused about there. Oh, okay, sorry. And then in... Um, Where's the package? Oh, right, package.json, great. Um, so in the, this uh, build.germaline thing, um, it basically uses package.json to install TiddlyWiki as a dependency, so it always builds with that correct version of TiddlyWiki. Okay. So, uh, sorry, forgive me. Um, let's go back to those files. Um, so we've got the language stuff um, where language folders where not all languages provide everything that they could. Um, mm -hmm. We've got the editions folder that at the moment just has the introduction edition and the translators edition, which is kind of annoying because they're just things that needed to go somewhere. They're not really editions in the sense of um, uh, configurations of TiddlyWiki that are designed to be reused. Um, well, they kind of are, no? <laughs> well, introduction maybe more so, but um, yeah. but translators is definitely a sort of behind the curtain thing. We've yeah. got the dev stuff, um, and in fact, you already get to, uh, uh, as I was saying, I think I need to change um, the front page. I had this experience of trying to find a link to the GitHub repo when we, I was on a projector using a mouse that couldn't reach the keyboard, um, and uh, those kinds of links are not very clear. In fact, you need to click through to the developer documentation and mm -hmm. then it's somewhere in here. But um, yeah, we need mm -hmm. to make, there's some basic things that people should expect to go to tiddlywiki.com for which need to be much more, much simpler. Um, yeah, I also posted today something where I was asking uh, that even for developers it might be very good to have some, uh, you know, how, how can I achieve this? Uh, kind of uh, walkthroughs, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, there's, 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 some, of, there's some of that, but, um, yeah. uh, but Tobias, I mean, you know you know perfectly well the issue there is that nobody has written them. Um, as yeah, I, yeah, of course. My, <laughs> my, um, my be well, I wasn't going to talk about the documentation, but my belief is that I need to focus on the developer documentation first. And the reason is uh, because there are happily a number of people who have now stepped up and involved in this very interesting discussion about structuring the documentation for end users of TiddlyWiki. And that makes me realize that um, uh, there's a lot of people who can write the introductory documentation. I'm the only person who can write the descriptions of yes. the best person to you know, write the, the detailed explanations of TiddlyWiki's mechanisms. So um, I'd made some minor, I'd, uh, <laughs> once I'd realized that, um, I immediately um, did some subtle reformatting of the dev wiki, but I will, uh, and bringing in the highlight plugin, making it a bit more usable, but I will uh, move to doing some documentation in that. Are there any plans to extract the code document or code comments uh, into a documentation type of uh, wiki? Um, this is actually one of those things that um, that we were probably discussing when you were a year and a half ago in the group. That, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, so I'm... Uh, J Jeremy, Jeremy uh, Daniello joined. Oh, great. Um, okay. Daniello, hello. Uh, let me let you in. Um, I'll stop screen sharing, actually. Uh, code comments. So um, the comments in the TiddlyWiki core code are um, frequently <laughs> written using um, TiddlyWiki wiki text. And uh, my plan, and I, I did do this in a, um, at an earlier point in the code, 
was uh, inspired by underscore. So underscore has um, annotated source code, which I really like this display, where if I um, opened up the same file um, in GitHub, what you would see is these comments to the left adjust um, the normal JavaScript comments, remove from the right-hand side, and put over to the left. Um, so I think that reads really nicely. And um, the, obviously, with TiddlyWiki, there's an opportunity for it to do this in the browser you know, dynamically. Um, and yes, that would be cool. Because roughly, I think there's a, there's a level of documentation that um, is incredibly of, of code of documentation about code that's very expensive to maintain separate from the code. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a it, it's a long time before I would, for instance, write API documentation about the wiki object because you know the scale with the resources we've got it just feels like um, until somebody else writes it basically the wiki.js source file is the best place to go and you know again you've been through this with Tiddly wiki classic but um, you very quickly get to the no. point where the only authoritative answer to certain questions is is to have a quick look at the code yeah for um, me a lot of this if not also would really be in the code in, in the core uh, code directly and then um, what's the word uh, well, removed uh, from it uh, during the build process, so you don't get all the comments in in, in your empty Tiddly wiki, but just uh, in the GitHub repo. And you can extract that and maybe render it with your underscore. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, the, solution. Uh, back in Tiddly wiki Classic, um, we went through this a few times about whether we should uglify, minify the um, um, distribution. Um, my view at the moment remains that um, it's probably, oh, well, in fact, I did some tests to see what the saving was, um, and it was pretty modest because, of course, we've already, um, tiddlywiki.com gets served with gzip compression um, and English text, uh, you know, like the comments, compresses amazingly well. And, of course, there's a very limited vocabulary from a compression point of view in the source code. So I kind of feel that the advantages of, of having readable source code everywhere outweighs, I mean, because one of the things, for instance, is that you never know when you're going to need to debug a tiddlywiki. And um, you know, being able to mm, debug uh, any tiddlywiki is, is quite handy. Um, I was just uh, suggesting minification. I was more uh, talking about uh, the actual code documentation, just the comments. So oh. um, into the next to the code where it belongs and uh, button, right? So you don't really need that in an empty. Yes, I mean, I, I guess um, as the volume of the comments increased, the yeah. the more that would be uh, important. Yeah. Um, but um, but it's uh, uh, but yes. So the other thing I was just going to point out in terms of Tiddlywiki.com um, is. We've also got a plugins folder that has a folder for each plugin. And at the moment, what we have in there is an index.html that includes the instructions and an empty.html, which means, ironically, that this plugins folder is actually, these are additions. You know, they, these absolutely are um, preloaded tiddlywiki HTML files that are designed for reuse. Um, and then we've got the pre-release folder, which is exactly the same stuff, but um, you know the copy that I push from time to time uh, that tracks head rather than being the latest version. Um, the uh, static folder. Jeremy, mm -hmm. I have a quick question about the plugins folder. If I was uh, to uh, create my own plugin, would you recommend that I would use the same structure to put an index HTML file in, in such a folder? And uh, uh, Yes, I, I mean, I think... Um, it, you could rephrase the question as, what's the best way to distribute an edition of TiddlyWiki? Because basically, you're, you, what, you're make, what you're talking about there is an edition that's designed um, to make it easier to get started with a particular plugin. And so, yes, yeah. I think that combination of an empty.html and an index.html is, is reasonable. <laughs> 
And um, would you like when I'm starting a plugin project? Would you recommend uh, having the whole um, TiddlyWiki five uh, uh, repo along alongside with it, or is do you, do I do there, there are good re there, there are um, hang on, let me on the screen share. There's several different ways to tackle this. Um, and um, each of those um, each of those arrangements has its moments when it's a good one. But roughly, I would not use the TiddlyWiki 5 repo unless you're doing something that could or should be submitted to the TiddlyWiki core. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is just a really simple one: is that if you're if you're working off of the TiddlyWiki repo, then that means that you forked the TiddlyWiki repo, which means that you need to, you know, from time to time, rebase it to get the latest um, version in. Um, whereas making your plugin in a standalone folder um, uh, it seems like it's a slightly easier from a GitHub point of view because then you've got your TiddlyWiki 5 repo that you're using for testing and your plugin repo. And although you'll have to refresh the TiddlyWiki 5 repo when there's an upstream change. You won't need to worry about merging you know, the changes from your plugin in. Um, but Mario, I know that uh, Mario's got some good reasons for why it's worth working with the repo. Yeah, there is. Uh, so in normal cases, I think it makes sense, like, like uh, as Jeremy does, that you create a package JSON uh, that lets you install TiddlyWiki alongside with the plugin, but be excluded from pushing to, to the GitHub repo, because if you uh, work with an um, editor that lets you search, global search, uh, then you get all the, the information from, from TiddlyWiki. So because, mm -hmm. for example, if you want to know for, uh, I don't know, dollartiddlyWiki.wiki, uh, which uh, objects are there, uh, and you don't have uh, the TiddlyWiki repo within the, the, the plugin structure, uh, then in normal cases the editor doesn't find it. So, okay. this, so this is sometimes it's it's handy to, to look up the, the different parameters mm. uh, that okay. are needed. Yeah? So for example, I'm, I'm using the brackets um, editor and it's a, I go to TiddlyWiki.wiki, say control E um, and get the source code of the, of the function. And this is extremely handy uh, if you need to look up the different parameters that you have to uh, to pass to the to the function. Uh, okay. But th then at the end, when when I'm finished, um, uh, so I, I just don't uh, push it to the to, to to GitHub. So the node modules are just excluded with Git ignore. Uh, okay. Yeah. So in normal cases, you, uh, I create an addition. Uh, which mm -hmm. has the explanation of the plugin and the plugins folder, um, mm -hmm. and then use the TiddlyWiki environment variables uh, so that the build process uh, finds finds the plugin and the addition. Mm -hmm. so this, normal case, this works works best. So, but the general workflow is to actually build your uh, test wiki for, via the build process. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. With 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 node node to the wiki and and then okay. uh, create an addition um, and the addition contains the tiddlywiki.info file, uh, which okay. defines all the plugins that you need, and the okay. environment variables tells uh, tiddlywiki where to find the the new plugin. Okay. This works. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we can, we can have we can have a look at uh, with with uh, Skype if you want. So yeah, it would hangout. be interesting to see your setup and how you work with yeah. it. That would be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I hope um, this is a precursor to uh, more Toby plugins. Um, <laughs> to <look forward> to. <laughs> um, um, yeah, um, probably additions too. So <laughs> yes, well, let's hope that's um, uh, as we were discussing. That's something I'd really like to get moving a bit more on. Um, yeah. I think what's really missing is some really simple additions. That, so addition that can do only one thing. So for example, um, a grocery list or something like this, a shopping list or to do. Uh, so let's let's say start with the well, simple. Yeah, the thing the thing that's on my list is actually to do exactly that to the task management example. So to basically make an addition that's got the task management tiddler from tiddlywiki.com 
and to add a couple of things that I couldn't do at the time. So a button to create a new task that will create a you know to do already tagged task, and to add some instructions. And I'm really interested in that as an example compared mm -hmm. to something like TW5 Scholars um, because it is so simple. And one of the things that we've discussed quite a lot is the way that um, you know, I'm pinning some hopes on the idea that TiddlyWiki will feel more approachable if, you, um, if it presents itself as being specific you know, to a particular task. So mm -hmm. hopefully that will give us a chance to experiment with that and see what it feels like. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we'll uh, I'll be needing to close in about five or ten minutes. Any other topics from anybody um, or thoughts or comments? Tobias, you must have questions. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. Um, did you have a look at this uh, LED filter thing that I was um, uh, developing over the last week, which I mentioned in a comment on Jitter? Oh, yes, yes. Um, uh, what do you think of the it, mechanics? It was let.tiddlyspot.com, is that right? Tiddlyspot, yeah, I think. Um, uh, Yes, so um, what I think about this is is loads of things. So the first thing is this is exactly the kind of experimentation that needs to go on in plugins. That you know this is what makes TiddlyWiki um, potentially such an awesome thing is that ten different people can be experimenting like this on ten different areas, and it's a great example of innovation in TiddlyWiki that's not limited by Jeremy, basically. Um, okay. because, uh, hopefully, Jeremy isn't being an obstacle to you doing this work. Um, and you, I know, of all the things that you could do, um, you're fulfilling a requirement that you know, very persistently we hear that people want to be able to do maths. And um, I've been saying for a year, I think, although some of the GitHub issues are quite old, that it's something that I would like to do. And it hasn't bubbled up to the top of my to-do list, um, and so therefore, you know, absolutely a perfect thing for somebody else to 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 work on. Um, I really like the way that you have presented it. Um, mm -hmm. So there's lots of examples, and you know, that's great. Really cool to see. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not convinced um, by the syntax, but. Mm -hmm. What does that matter? It's that's yeah, the, no. that's the least important thing. I mean, I, I, I and I said why I think in GitHub that it feels as though if we're doing maths, um, yeah. we should support maths notation that people are used to, which means I think a JavaScript style expression syntax. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and that's okay because putting in a parser for um, a JavaScript expression, you know, for a simple subset of JavaScript expressions, I'm sure you've seen these things, that you, you can do them in a hundred lines of JavaScript. You know, yeah. there's, there's plenty of complexity in parsing JavaScript, but designing a useful subset of JavaScript expressions that works, um, that is easy to parse, is very straightforward. So, um, but it's still, you know, it's more complicated. Um, yeah. Eric in the sidebar is saying, how about reverse Polish notation? And that's kind of what I mean, that I don't think we should, well, I mean, I've no obje absolutely no objection to reverse Polish <laughs> notation existing. <laughs> but um, if we're adding maths to the core, um, then I think um, I would say conventional maths notation feels like the thing that gives least surprises. So that it feels to me that still that the filter syntax is the place to put it, so it feels mm. as though maybe what I'd be interested in is something where the operand was, you know, an expression using um, plus minus brackets, etc. Um, uh, and yeah, still lots of details to work out about how you refer to mm. fields, how you refer to string constants, Jeremy. and so on. Yeah. Jeremy, quest question about core versus plugin. Something like maths. Which obviously um, you said, well, it looks like it fits into the filter architecture. And since filters are easily done as plugins, should maths be quote unquote in the core or just supported by the core? Um, yes, yeah, so the motivation of putting maths in the core is because I think it's a universal requirement. Um, there's many, many things, you know, even for you, I'm not suggesting that there are users. <clears throat> 
um, I mean, the users who think of themselves as doing maths in TiddlyWiki, that mainly means the KTEX plugin. Um, but uh, being able to have in counters that automatically increment, being able to calculate totals of lists, those kinds of things, I think, are, are near universal requirements. Another reason why I think it needs to go to the core, into the core, is because it requires a you know new mechanism. Tiddly Wikitext, as it stands right now, just doesn't have that particular piece of expressiveness. So I think where you're, um, a, what am I trying to say? So I think I, what I'm ending up saying is extensions to Wikitext belong in the core, and that's clearly not the case. Maybe it's more about extensions to filters um, that are intended to solve general problems belong in the core, you know, if they reflect um, very common use cases. So sorry, course, that's a poor they, answer. They, they, well, oh, I, I see what you're getting at here, and I'm sort of wondering where the line gets drawn to. So, so then they could be done as, quote unquote, you could call them core plugins in that they're in the core, but that they're still, you know, it's, it's still essentially a plugin architecture. Well, we've, got, so we've got that already. We've got the, the TiddlyWiki plugins. So plugins in TiddlyWiki 5 have a publisher name and then a plugin name. So all the plugins that start TiddlyWiki, TiddlyWiki slash um, file system, etc., are pretty much what you described. They're part of the official GitHub repo. They're tested along with the TiddlyWiki core. I try not to use the phrase core plugins because in TiddlyWiki 5, core now means something very specific, which is this plugin called core that contains all the main shadow tiddlers. Um, but core right. plugins actually does still feel like a, uh, yeah, a, 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 an unsurprising name. Um, well, what I'm thinking of is along the lines of bloat versus microkernel. You know, how much how much does go into the core because it's, you know, and, and whether or not in a microkernel architecture you make it so that, yes, it's distributed as part of the core, but people could make a strip, stripped down version that didn't have it. What I found with TiddlyWiki Classic is although we need to keep an eye on the size of the core, um, using the size of the core as a rationale for whether or not to move something into the core, I feel is seldom the right thing to look at. Um, because the logic for what goes in the core, I think, is more about um, generality and ubiquity and usefulness and so on. And if we, so for instance, if right now it suddenly became important to try and make the core plugin be smaller, there's a lot of different things we could do um, uh, that would stop short of, um, uh, of, of putting everything into a plugin. Excuse me. Um, but it's the, I mean, I, yeah, I think um, where we stand now, the core plugin, uh, of course, as was discussed in the list, there's no easy way to get the length of a plugin. But um, if I, oh, hang on, I'll screen share because then you'll be able to see why I'm not speaking. It's because I'm typing. Um, so I was just going to go TW wiki. To the text of the core plugin and just get its length. So the core plugin, oh, I can't even read that, is 982 kilobytes at the moment. Um, I, I don't really have a kind of um, specific <laughs> point at which I would get worried, but I think the core, the core could be 50% bigger before I would be starting to think, ouch. Um, so obviously I'm not suggesting that I would let it get 50% bigger, um, but I don't think a one megabyte core is a problem. Yeah, but there is still there is still documentation in it. Uh, not in the core plugin. Ah, okay. Um, but there's still, um, I mean, the... Let me see if I, if I unscreen share. Let me see if I can just find... Oh, and I wasn't screen sharing somehow. Um, let me see if I can just find the apps I did on minification. Um,
Sorry, you're now. I'm still not screen sharing, so you're looking at me sticking my tongue out whilst I'm searching my email, which may not be, <laughs> um, which may not be the most useful. Uh, let me think what else I can search for. Okay, I'll try and dig it up. Um, uh, but the uh, minifying, um, uh, I think, would be um, the biggest next step. You know, in terms of. Um, cutting tens of kilobytes off the core size, and as uh, Tobias points out, a intermediate step where we remove comments but don't minify the code would provide a uh, interim. I also think that the, the, the uh, what makes Telewiki.com big at the moment, if you download everything, uh, is basically the translations. So yes, that is becoming a worry, and the size of the um, the, the, the corresponding thing that's also quite big is upgrade.html. Mm. Upgrade.html is now four and a half megabytes. Mm. Yeah, and also this is the already the, the load time of dailywiki.com isn't isn't very nice anymore. No, there's. Um, I'm worried that I'm not sure that. I'm not sure that I've got things set up to get the best performance out of GitHub pages, which is an additional worry. But um, you see, when you load tiddlywiki.com, do you know how much data is actually transferred? Yeah, for me, I think it, it, when I think it needs about one and a half seconds or two seconds, uh, which is close to the to the edge, normal cases where I, where I say close close the top. So let me. Um, the the normal case is if, I, if I go to a to a page and I need to wait for two and a half seconds or three seconds, I'm gone. Yeah. Now understood. But look here, the um, when you load to Newiki.com, 820 kilobytes gets transferred. Um, so that was the, one of the things that I was um, fumbling around for. That's the results of GZ mm. compression. Um, so I think that's quite significant because um, uh, I think some of the, I mean, some of the performance issues is actually about you know that you can. Oh dear! No, I messed it up. Um, there we go. Um, uh, we need to do some more diving because um, one of the things that's going on is the amount of time it takes um, to parse the HTML. So I think the um, the blank screen on startup of tiddlywiki.com I think is a problem um, that we could do much better um, in terms of the time to get the first content up on the screen. Because you know the Tiddlywiki HTML file um, ships with no visible HTML until the JavaScript kicks in. So um, what I'm trying to say by showing the 820 kilobytes is to suggest that reducing the file size will clearly have a proportional impact on the load time that you're experiencing. But I don't think it's the low-hanging fruit. I think the low-hanging fruit is to analyze ruthlessly what happens during startup and to yeah. try and bring yeah. forwards those things that cause the um, you know the comfort of the screen to be displayed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because it is already uh, gzip, so this is not really the problem, I think. But yeah, yeah. The, the, the the time the time to content is is a problem already. And there's um, I mean, while we're on the subject, there's quite a few other. Um, uh, things that that make Tiddlywiki slow as an architect or slower than it needs to be as an architectural level. Um, one is the way that because we display all the SVG images as uh, oh we don't anymore. I was going to talk about displaying SVG images as data URIs, but I mean that does still happen. But toolbar buttons are not data URIs anymore. Um, anyway. I think we should draw to a close. So, um, uh, are there any more comments or thoughts on any of that? Um, Nathan posted in the sidebar a link to a JavaScript expression ex interpreter in JavaScript, and and yes, illustrating the point that it's um, it's not a it's not rocket science. Um, a little expression evaluator. 
guys. Um, that one's kind of kind of particularly neat because it just uses um, attack expressions, um, and it's it's dead simple how it does it. Um, it and on top of it, it, it has a lot of you know nice matrix manipulation facilities and and whatnot that it sort of builds on um, very simply. Oh, okay. So okay, it's much, much more. more. I'm so sorry. I hadn't appreciated it. It is much more than. Uh, I'd inferred from the point at which you pressed the link. Oh, great. Well, I'll... I'll the link doesn't, really, uh, doesn't really do it justice, uh, uh, you know, in many ways. Hey, cool. Well, I shall um, have a dig around. Um, guys, so... Uh, ooh, where's my... Brett window, there we go. Um, uh, so it remains to say, for me to say thank you very much to all of you for joining me today. Very much appreciated. Um, Eric, thank you very much for showing us um, the work you've been doing with Android and Cordova. Um, that's very exciting. I'm very pleased to see everybody here. I'll look forward to uh, seeing you hopefully next week for the Hangout at the same time. Um, but for the moment, guys, cheers. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.